Podcast. Eddie Lacy, Mike Daniels, Gilbert Brown, Don Barclay, Micah Hyde, your Green Bay Packers, yesterday's legends and today's superstars. From corporate or nonprofit events to private parties, add some spice, hire a Packers player from Mayfield Sports Marketing. For details, just go to PackersTalk.com and click on Player Appearances. Are you looking for some signed Packer memorabilia? Look no further than Waukesha Sports Cards. If the Green Bay Packer can sign it, Waukesha Sports Cards has it. Check our website for upcoming Packer player and legend signing. Go to WaukeshaSportsCards.com. Well, hello everyone and welcome. It is Sunday afternoon. This is a season-ending version of Pulse of the Pack. I'm sure you watched the game last night. Uh, and you know exactly why I'm talking the way that I am. Once again, my tone of voice can probably tell you a lot about the way this show is going to go, uh, but the Packers lost last night 26-20 to 20 in overtime to end their season. I am your host, Jacob Westendorf, and with me as always is Jason Perrone, and we are both finally in the same time zone and the same temperature zone. It is zero degrees here. Jason, below zero up there, right? Probably our first show, Jacob, where your temperature exceeds mine. I am in the suburbs of the greater Minneapolis area. It is minus nine, but it could not be anywhere near as cold as my mood is right now after the game that was last night. But glad to be back in the Midwest. We're going to focus on the positives. What did Mike McCarthy say two weeks ago when they lost to Minnesota? I'm tired of talking about all the damn negatives. So on we move, Jacob. Onward we move, definitely, and before I start, um, I have a special listener listening into this show. Actually, <laughs> Jason, oddly enough, they're out where you used to be. Uh, my Grandma Paula and my Grandpa Mike are listening to this show. Uh, Grandpa, not doing so well health-wise, uh, but much like the team did last night, I have faith he's going to bounce back. So, Mike, uh, I know you're listening, Grandpa. I love you, and uh, I hope that you uh, can fight through this. Um, I think about you every day, Grandpa. So, hope everything takes turn for the better out there. I believe that it can. But this is a show about football, so we are going to talk football. As I mentioned, the Packers lost last night 26-20. to It was a game we both expected them to lose. We picked it as such previously. Um, but the way that it unfolded is not the way I expected at all. The defense was good for most of the game. The offense was understandably not as good. Um, and it was understandably not as good because after a free play where Rodgers hit Randall Cobb, Randall landed really hard on his back and suffered a bruised lung. And <laughs> once that happened, if you went into the regular season and mapped out the Packers' depth chart, their top four wide receivers did not play in that game. That means no Jordy Nelson, no Randall Cobb, no Devontae Adams, and no Ty Montgomery. The reason I don't mention James Jones is because James Jones would not be on this team if Jordy Nelson had never gotten hurt. So the Packers played the majority of their game with James Jones, Jared Aberderis, and the people's champ, Jeff Janis. And I want to start the show. You said you want to focus on the positive. Well, here you go. I'm going to start on the positive because I deserve some crow, um, maybe a little bit at least, because I never in a million years thought Jeff Janis would have a playoff game with seven catches, 145 yards, and two touchdowns. Now, 101 of those yards came on the last series of the game where it was kind of schoolyardy stuff, but nonetheless, he made plays. So, I deserve some crow for a lot of the doubts that they threw Janice's way this season. And, Jason, that seems to be how we're starting all these shows. You were kind of with me on the Jeff Janice thing, so let's start with him. Uh, what do you think of his performance, and do, we, do you deserve some crow as well? Yeah, everyone deserves some crow, except for the legions of crazy Twitter followers who, you know, it's always kind of funny when, they, when the universe tilts in their favor every once in a while and they win a battle. You always hear about it in droves, and we are definitely seeing a lot of that on Twitter and people who said, why has Jeff Janis been on the bench? But what's funny is is that unless you follow the Packers closely, if you're a fan of any other team, you probably had never heard of Jeff Janis prior to yesterday. So this is only going to fuel the Jeff Janis fire 
that has already been burning for two years now in Green Bay. Fans have been clamming, clamoring for him to get on the field. He played very well last night. I think the biggest lesson to take away here is that if a player has a talent or a skill set, they need to find a way, if he's going to be on the roster, and Jeff Janis was active for every game this season because he was a big contributor on special teams, but with receivers going down with the injuries to Jordy and Devontae Adams missing some significant time, Ty Montgomery missing half the season, you've got to find ways to get your playmakers in positions and to utilize their skill set to do more. And so I think we're all wondering, this was a successful season in terms of getting the play. We're all wondering what might have come if Green Bay had worked Janice in a little bit sooner and stuck with him. The offense had its struggles. I mean, when there's no time to throw the ball, you're not going to throw a bomb to Jeff Janice just because that's just the, the shot play and the deep ball just wasn't there. Couldn't get separation. Couldn't get time for Rodgers to throw it. And, of course, the big touchdown catch that Janice makes last night was a Hail Mary, so we all know how those go. Those are very schoolyardy and up for grabs. But he beat one of the best cornerbacks in the league for the ball, came down with it, scored the touchdown to give the chance to tie, which, you know, Crosby added the extra point, and they did. But, yes, we're all eating crow. Janice, great performance. And it's only going to it's only going to incite a big competition for the at the wide receiver position this this upcoming training camp. I mean, Janice is is only going to be. I mean, I can't. The first training camp practice, I almost have to be there in person because I want to measure how loud the ovation is going to be for that guy. Jacob, would you agree? <laughs> I can almost guarantee that I will be there for the very same reason. Hopefully, we can be there together. Uh, and I agree. I, I think that you know that's only going to make the. It's only going to make the clamoring for Janice to get on the field louder. And you know what? It's not such a bad problem to have. Jason, we talked about the receiving core all season. Now that the offseason is hit, you know, you look at next year and Jordy's back, Randall will be healthy again. Uh, you imagine that Cobb's level of play will rise because they'll have guys on the boundary that can play, Nelson specifically. Devontae Adams, arguably you can't have a worse 50-catch year than what he had this year. Um, you think he'll be better. Montgomery will be back healthy. And I think those two guys last night, Aberderis and Janice, showed that you know they belong in this league. So the Packers, I think, have some depth at the receiver position, and that is something that you can't really be too upset about uh, going into next year. Maybe they, you know, maybe they don't need a wide receiver as badly as we thought. Uh, and we'll talk about that obviously as this day goes on as well. Not a whole lot really to discuss offensively throughout the game. I do want to go to the final possession though. They're backed up inside their own ten, and. You know, it's 4th and 20, Rodgers buys time, rolls left and finds, guess who? Jeff Janis. Janis makes the catch. They waste a ton of time trying to run a play, get the ball spiked. There's 12 seconds left by the time that whole series of events ends. Rodgers rolls right, throws the ball into the turf. There's 5 seconds left, and we're in the same situation that we were in Detroit. It was Hail Mary time, Rodgers rolls left, throws one up, and guess who? Jeff Janis is there. Rodgers with an insane throw, Janis with a great catch, ball's caught, Packers score a touchdown. It is now 20 to 19. And Jason, we're kind of rebranding here. We have a new Twitter account. It is at Packer Pulse. So at Packer Pulse is where you want to follow for our official Twitter account now. And we got our first question. Christina Nargalwala. I'm sorry, Christina, if I'm pronouncing your name poorly. She is at Green Ethics. So at Green Ethics for this first question. And if you send us questions during the show when we go live, we will do our best to answer them on the air. So she asked, should they have gone for two after the Hail Mary? And my answer to that question is it's really hard to say one way or the other. I know, you know, the Packers' record last night, after last night's 0-7 in overtime with Aaron Rodgers as a starting quarterback. That sounds insane, but apparently it's true. You know, you can't read anything on the Internet that's not true, right? So back-to-back years now, the Packers have had a playoff game end without them possessing the ball. So they lose the coin flip, the Cardinals go down the field and score. Obviously that hurts. They want to know, should they have gone for two? I will say I can't fault Mike McCarthy for not going for two there because I'm in firm belief that Mike Tomlin is the king of, you know, the new way of thinking with the extra points. Go for two because it's closer, your odds are better, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to say no uh, because, like I said, I can't fault him because I don't think even Mike Tomlin would have gone for two in that situation. He would have kicked the extra point and taking his chances in overtime. If the Packers make it, obviously they win, but if they miss it, you're talking about how, you know, if they kick the extra point, who knows what happens in overtime. So as far as going for two, I think it's an easy question to ask knowing the result, but Mike McCarthy at the time doesn't know that the Packers are never going to get the ball back after that play. It's hard to say. I'm okay with the decision. I think it was the right decision, even though the result was poor. Jason, everyone's asking him. Should they have gone for two with all the momentum that was clearly in their favor after that play? 
Well, first of all, I want to talk about the Hail Mary because how improbable is it? I mean, we always think that we're never going to see something again. We always think records won't be broken and things aren't going to change or, you know, this won't happen again. But that was an absolutely incredible play and throw by Aaron Rodgers in a season in which he struggled by his standards, by his career standards, struggled, I use my quote fingers, and had his issues with getting the ball off, his passing accuracy, all the different things that went wrong. He makes the best throw of his season when it matters the most, and this team needs it the most. On one play with one chance to somehow tie and try to win this game, pulls it off, going left, throwing right. Remember, in Detroit, he rolled right, so he was rolling to his strong side, had a chance to take a couple steps and throw it. He was rolling left. Arizona was smarter than Detroit. Not a difficult task. Actually rushed Rodgers and did what they were supposed to do on a Hail Mary try, but Rodgers still got the ball off. Janice made a great catch. No, you don't go for two in that situation. Everybody can say now should have gone for two because of the disastrous way that the game ended. And it's it's always the whole argument, hindsight is twenty twenty. At the time, I said you don't absolutely do not go for two. You go for the tie and you give yourself a chance. Now the stats and what people will come back to us and say is that the Packers' record in overtime is, is so bad with you know since Rodgers became the starter that why wouldn't you take that into consideration and try to win the game? They always say the old adage is you go for the win on the road, the tie at home. I mean, there was every reason to think when you have a 50-50 chance of getting the ball first that Green Bay was going to be able to move the ball. The offense had success throughout the day. They were able to move the football. There's a chance they were going to be able to score, put the pressure on Arizona. You got Arizona reeling because – now they're tied again. They've, they've lost their lead in the last second on a huge play like that. It's a stunner. So it's a good time to try to catch them off guard a little bit. So, no, I was okay with, with taking the one. You know, Crosby's a lot more sure than any other play that the offense could have run from two yards out. Arizona's got a really good defense. So that was good. I was good with them going for one. Incredible play. You know, I think we might have used up our allotment of Hail Mary for about the next 20 or 30 years, though. So people out there in Packers land, Don't count on it, although never say never, the odds will tell you, probably not likely for quite some time. Odds will tell you it wasn't likely for quite some time going into that play. Also, one thing I do want to point out, too, is, Jason, you said it, you know, money time, best throw. Can we please put to bed the Aaron Rodgers as a clutch narrative? I know the record is poor in overtime. I know the fourth quarter comeback thing that the Skip Baylesses of the world and such want to point out all the time. Don't give me that crap. Aaron Rodgers went down the field and tied the game, albeit with some help. He didn't do it alone. But he went down the field and tied the game. Uh, He made a hell of a throw. And I know that there's some luck involved in the Hail Mary. I understand that. But that throw was fantastic. And I'm convinced there maybe Cam Newton and maybe Jay Cutler, as far as quarterbacks that have the arm to make that kind of throw. There aren't a lot of quarterbacks that can make the play that Rodgers did, especially under duress, under pressure, throws it up for grabs. Janice makes a hell of a play in the end zone. But I never want to hear again that Aaron Rodgers isn't clutch because he let a comeback drive without his top four wide receivers. Again, like I said, no Jordy, no Cobb, no Montgomery, no Adams. He's playing with, as my as my former colleague, uh, well, actually current colleague, I guess you say, former co-host, Ross Uglum, used to say, it's, it was James Jones and a bunch of children out there. I mean, that's what it was. Going into the season, his second and third wide receivers had totaled four receptions, all of which by Jeff Janis, or actually going into that game, I should say. Uh, the number is not very high. I know Janis had two catches coming into the year. He had two catches during the season. I don't have Aberderis' numbers in front of me. Regardless, those numbers are small. The experience at the receiving core was very limited, very limited. Aaron Rodgers deserves a lot of credit for what happened last night. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I think the guy is one of the best, if not the best, quarterback in football. I think the only one you can argue with me about is is Tom Brady. Aaron Rodgers just finished off one of his worst seasons as a starter, and his passer rating was still 93. That's still very good. Again, like I said, let's let's put to bed the narrative that Aaron Rodgers isn't good. He's washed up. He's not clutch. Those kinds of things. <laughs> let's talk about the defense now. Uh, you know, the defense really did play well for the most of the game. You know, you, you almost come to expect, and maybe it's maybe it's deserved. Uh, you know, that the Packers defense is going to wilt under pressure in a big game, and they're going to give up 500 yards or something stupid like that. They didn't do that last night. However, they did have too many almost plays. Jake Ryan almost has an interception on the Cardinals on the Cardinals touchdown drive to take the lead. Uh, Sam Shields almost has two interceptions. Now, I'll give him a little bit of slack for the first one. 
where the Cardinals ended up kicking a field goal because I don't think he expected the ball to be there. The second one, however, was pitch and catch. And if Shields catches that ball, he might score. Too many almost plays made last night and not enough real plays were made. Uh, give some credit to the guys who did make plays. Ha-ha Clinton Dix. You know, Jason, we have that adage of all he does. I guess all Ha-ha Clinton Dix does in playoff games is make, make interceptions because that was his third interception in his third playoff game as a pro. This guy, I think, is going to be a star. Uh, I still think that way. I said that coming into the season. I think he had a really good year, and I think that he made some plays last night uh, that make you think, you know, the Packers are in pretty good shape in the secondary. Demarius Randall played very well, had a really nice interception in the end zone. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen that route run against the Packers where the guy's got nobody within four steps of him. So Demarius Randall recovers, makes the interception, keeps the Cardinals off the board. Now, the Packers' offense didn't do anything with it, but Randall still gave the Packers. It preserved the Packers' lead and gave them gave their offense a chance to close the game out. But all that being said, the gaps, I think the biggest one, Jason, and you talked about this after the game, and I think that some of it was misunderstood. For those of you that followed him along on Twitter, it's at Jason Perrone. I, I think that, you know, I understood the point you were trying to make, and I think that some people didn't. Uh, you know, some of the fire is going to come to Dom Capers. And ultimately, you know, I know the defense played well. That was really the reason that they were in the playoffs in the first place because the offense wasn't good. But they get a Hail Mary. They score a touchdown, they kick the extra points, tie the game, and then the Cardinals offense scores in three plays. And the Packers offense never gets the opportunity to touch the ball because of the rules that are in place. And we will talk about those rules as well. Julius Peppers, veteran, former pro bowler, and over the last two years he's been one of the best players on the Packers defense. He was the one that was out of position on the Larry Fitzgerald play. That is two consecutive years that he's made some sort of gaff in a big playoff game. This year, obviously, the Fitzgerald play. Last year... Morgan Burnett gets an interception, and albeit he was told by some of his coaches, but Peppers gives him the no mas, go down sign. Morgan Burnett slides. We all know what happened from there. That's a year ago tomorrow, for those of you that want more misery in your life. Two consecutive years with gaffes like that. Who are you blaming for all this, Jason? And I know that you have a pretty strong opinion on this stuff, so the floor is yours. Well, you mentioned Ha Ha Clinton Dix, and the one thing that made that play even better was that he's not really been great in his downfield coverage. You know, he's improved his game this year on his at play in the line of scrimmage and run support. He's become a sure, more sure tackler. He's still beginning of the year was still diving at the feet of defenders. In fact, I think I think it was week one against the Bears. Maybe it was Demarius Randall. I think it was Ha Ha though was just diving at nothing and Forte juked him for a long run. He's improved, made the jump from year one to year two. The play that he made, the interception against Arizona, was downfield, nice break on the ball, gets inbound, stays inbound, catches the ball. You mentioned Sam Shields. You know, Shields didn't come up with two interceptions that he should have. Playmakers make plays. It doesn't matter whether they didn't see the ball coming, they didn't know if it was coming, it hit their hands, they dropped it, they're not a receiver, there's a reason they're not receivers, they're defensive backs. Teams make plays. As we sit here doing this show right now, the Seattle Seahawks are getting run out of Carolina right now. Carolina has a couple turnovers they've forced. Luke Keekley, pick six. You can't score if you don't have the ball. And it's not that Sam Shields needed to score, but you don't get the turnover, you don't get the credit, you don't make the big play, and then ultimately your team doesn't win the game if you don't make big plays like that. So playmakers, obviously a big part of what the defense relies on and what they've been relying on all season long. You mentioned Julius Peppers. Peppers was brought in to be a 14-year veteran presence on this defense to contribute, to help some of these young guys come along. He's still got a couple good years in the tank. He has not missed a game since he's come to Green Bay. He has not missed hardly any games in his career. It is incredible. A man of that size has missed so few games that you can count them on one hand and have several fingers still left over to throw a curveball. But in the last two playoff losses, Jacob, like you mentioned, last year against Seattle, he gives Burnett the slide sign. That may have been coached. That may have been requested by the sideline. But he gives Burnett the slide signal. We all know what happened after that. Last night, his instincts take over, and for some reason, he abandons his post and his own coverage to get after Carson Palmer, who breaks pocket, leaves Larry Fitzgerald wide open, and Larry Fitzgerald does what Larry Fitzgerald does, did what Larry Fitzgerald does, which is make guys miss and make really big plays. And it was very frustrating to watch because Peppers is a guy that you count on. So through all of these defensive mistakes that I watched last night, it's great that they had a good season and they got this team in position and kept them in games when the offense was sputtering and Aaron Rodgers was struggling. But it all comes down to what you are in the end. You know, it's one thing if Arizona makes a great diving catch for a touchdown in the end zone and they win by 10 points, they win by 7 points. The defense did everything that they could. But when you can look back at a defense that has made these plays throughout the season that didn't do it in the biggest game of the year, it's frustrating. It's disappointing. 
players have to execute, so there's only so much you can put on coaches in that situation. This is the strength of this team, and a lot of these defensive players are hopefully going to be back next year. Now, there's some, there's some from free agents. You got B.J. Raji, Casey Hayward, Mike Neal, and Nick Perry as the biggest names on defense that are free agents, and I don't think all four of them are going to come back. But you're going to largely have the core of this team back. I don't recall whether Peppers had a third year on his deal or if he's going to be a free agent and would come back. I think if he's willing to and wants to come back, I think Green Bay needs to consider it strongly. But the message to these young guys is I see potential here. Like we were talking about before the show, Jacob, this, this defense has the potential really to be a top five in the league if they make the jump next year that they, they hopefully can make from this year to next year. You're going to have Demarius Randall with a year of experience, Quentin Rollins with a year of experience, Ha Ha gets a year older, smarter. All these guys have another year. In the, you know, Jake Ryan, a guy like Jake Ryan, I, you know, he doesn't have the speed. He never will. It's not something you can coach. But Jake Ryan nearly had an interception yesterday against the Cardinals, he takes a jump forward, not to mention who they're possibly you know, going to add in the draft this year. But I think after this long, with some of these guys that have been there this entire time and this, this defensive regime under Dom Capers, Clay Matthews, B.J. Raji, I think the team might benefit from a fresh voice on defense. And it does sound a little ridiculous because that was not the problem this year. That wasn't the, the issue on this team. It was the offense. Everybody's talking about the offensive coaching staff and offensive changes. But you know, we saw the offense – come to life and do some good things against the Cardinals team playing at home with that crowd, you know, very few pre-snap penalties against the Packers. They figured it out. Mike McCarthy took back the play calling. I think there's things the offense can do when they've got all of their players and everything clicking and working. I think that was more of a mental thing than an issue with the guys on the field. So it's the defense to me that this team needs to focus on and make sure does take that leap because if they're able to improve over what this season was, this team is going to be viable at the very least next year. And that's extremely. I mean, they're going to be a very tough out. And I think they win the games they didn't win this year that they should have and live up to the potential that you and I were talking about during the preseason before before the season started. You know, they're going to get some of these guys back on offense. On defense, though, they've got to put the right guy. And now, you know, the next, the next thing that everyone says is, well, who are you going to bring in? Don't complain about your defensive coordinator unless you've got a guy. I don't necessarily have a guy. I think the 3-4 scheme is a fit, and they have the players for it right now. I don't know how easily they'd be able to transition to a 4-3 if they had to. I don't think they should. But I think it's worth looking into. You know, Dom Capers has been, you know, this was his, what, seventh season with the team. So now it's seventh or eighth. So it's you know, McCarthy's been around longer, and some people will say, well, you know, last night, you know, Corey Jennerjohn, one of my co-writers over at Cheesehead TV, said if you're going to get rid of Capers, you might as well get rid of Mike McCarthy. And I thought that was, you know, what I said to Corey was I think that's kind of throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater because there's, there's certain things that need to be changed. And as much as everyone thinks it's ridiculous, and the Fire Capers bandwagon has been alive for a long time, so for me to jump on it does make me look kind of bad. And I knowingly get on it knowing that it's going to be a bad look to certain people because – it's the popular thing that people like to do whenever something doesn't go their way. They want somebody fired. They want somebody cut. They want somebody benched. But I have my reasons for it, and I just kind of laid it out there. I, do, I think this defense is actually, you know, sneaky in a sneaky way. You know, you think they're just going to show up and be good next year, but I think the coaching is going to be a big piece of it because the, the fundamentals and the soundness of this team really seem to kind of disappear in these big playoff games. They just seem to lose or, or drop these you know, I guess drop their pants, you know, for lack of a better term, in these big moments, and they lose in such spectacular fashion. It is becoming very predictable and painful to watch. And like we were talking about before the show, Jacob, this defense, I don't know how or why I have any reason to believe this team can get past the conference championship. They've done it once, and this team just doesn't. They, they max out, they reach a certain point, and then it's almost like the opposing team has to give it away in order for them to, to get over that hump and get to the next step. So that's kind of where I'm at as far as the defense goes and my theories on capers. We'll talk about that a lot more during the offseason and as things move along and the draft and free agency. But that's my initial take is, you know, it was so unfortunate because the one strength that this team could rely on and all they had to do was get off the field, give the ball to the offense with a chance to score in any way and win this game, and they just failed, you know, in, a, in, in an epic way because of the way that it went down with the, with the run for Fitzgerald and then on the last play of the game, you know, he goes in untouched. So unfortunate, but now it's, it's water under the bridge, but this defense has a lot to build on, and, and if they do the right thing, I like how they look in, in 2016. 
Well, I'm going to piggyback on this um, because I think it's a discussion worth having because I've had this conversation before. You know, but I've, I've talked about it before how, you know, I thought the team needed some, not drastic, but some changes to get them over the hump. And, you know, it's very easy to say that when after the regular season ends, the Packers are a four and six football team. Uh, you know, four and six team after starting six and zero, they lose the division title in the process. They lose any chance of a home playoff, any realistic chance, I should say, of a home playoff game. One of the coordinators I have come under fire is Dom Capers, and let me start by saying, Jason, I don't think either one of us are blaming him for last night's result. I think that would be ridiculous. Now, if you want to blame him for the way the 2011 defense performed all season, the 2012 defense wilted against Colin Kaepernick, I understand those. Uh, those are, it's very viable to blame the D coordinator, the, the head of the unit, for the way that team has gone. But the question I have asked, since Aaron Rodgers broke his collarbone, because when that happened, a lot of those issues kind of came to light. The offense wasn't as good. They needed to rely on old school football, defense, and their running game. Running game did okay because they had Eddie Lacy, a much more in shape and quick and dynamic Eddie Lacy. They had that. They had a healthy offensive line. They could run the ball well enough. Now, they didn't score a whole lot of points because, realistically, this is the National Football League. And if you're going to score in the NFL, you need to have some resemblance of a passing game. Well, the Packers didn't have that. And because of that, you know, they had a lot of different things go wrong. Well, during that time, the question I asked was, look at the amount of draft picks the Packers have spent on this defense. And this year, I think, is the year where you kind of saw some of the issues with having to draft defense as much as they have. What I mean by that is you saw the depth of the offense kind of take a hit. The tight end position is horrendous. The offensive line depth was not good. Don Barclay is one of the worst backup tackles in football, and I said that at the beginning of the season. At what point do the results of this defense not meet the investment that is being placed in them? They've spent a lot of draft capital on that defense, and the results aren't meeting that. Even last year. Last year, we were patting the defense on the back saying, you know what, it wasn't a bad unit. I'm tired of giving this defense passes. I'm tired of saying, you know what, it wasn't so bad. You know, we've got an offense, you know, if they can hold the if they can hold the other team to about twenty points or so, you know, twenty one to twenty four points, the Packers are going to win. I'm sick of that. I don't want to hear that this defense only needs to do a little bit. I want to hear that this defense is on the same level as, you know, the Carolina Panthers or the Seattle Seahawks. Now I get it, the Seahawks have one of the greatest defensive units maybe ever. Certainly not showing up today as the score is currently thirty one to seven against the Carolina Panthers. However, this defense needs to have the mentality, forget Ben, but don't break. Forget only giving it up. I want a defense that has the mentality of that of Mike Daniels. We want to kick your ass and then tell you all about it. I'm okay with that. I want this defense to be dominant. I don't know if it can be dominant under Dom Cafers. Now, one of my questions that I always ask, you know, because when people ask to fire Mike McCarthy, you know, my question is, well, if not Coach Mack, then who? Okay, well, then my answer, because I have to have an answer, otherwise I'm a hypocrite, my answer within the organization is Joe Witt, the second or the cornerbacks coach. Look at those guys. Demarius Randall was a rookie. He was a starter on a team that was overtime away from the NFC Championship game. Overtime away from the NFC Championship game, with really two rookies playing a pretty big role, especially the last couple of weeks with Sam Shields being out. He developed Tremont Williams. He developed Sam Shields, two undrafted rookies. He developed Devon House. That's another fourth round pick. He's developed a lot of players that have really gotten them into the into the upper echelon. They have a really good secondary, I think. You know, we're talking about Casey Hayward not coming back. I think they're okay if that happens. They have Ladarius Gunter as a depth guy who played well in the sparing amount of time that he played. Demarius Randall looks like a player. Quentin Rollins looks like a player. Sam Shields is a player. Aha Clinton Dix is a player. Morgan Burnett is a player. Becker's secondary is loaded. Now, I'm not going to say they're the second coming of the Legion of Boom, but they are a very, very good group back there. I think the front seven has the players. Dayton Jones, Mike Daniels, Clay Matthews. I think they need a little bit of injection and talent at the linebacker spot, and obviously we're going to talk about that. However, I think Joe Witt has earned an opportunity within the organization, and last year I was all over it. Wade Phillips or Vic Fangio? Vic Fangio ended up in Chicago. Uh, Wade Phillips is in Denver. Vic Fangio did a hell of a job at that Bears defense, and I know that their rankings won't show as much, but you guys saw how bad the Bears defense was a year ago. Embarrassing levels of bad in Chicago. And I hear all about that living in Bears country. So I thought Fangio did a good job considering the lack of talent he had out there. And Wade Phillips has arguably the best defense remaining in the NFL playoffs. So those would have been my two guys. Now, with the way this season's played out and such, obviously Fangio, Wade Phillips, guys like that aren't going to be available. So if you want me to give an answer of who, my answer is Joe Witt. Um, And I think that that would be 
a pretty solid, pretty solid hire. It'd be a new voice for the most part. At some point, Jason, you know, you and I talked about this pre-show, how when's a good time to go? You know, Don Capers isn't a young guy. I'm not suggesting he's not a good coach. I think, you know, for the most part, he's a, he's a good coach. But, again, I know last night Carson Palmer didn't play as well as he normally does, but I still have the questions of Peyton Manning looked like Peyton Manning, not this version that we've watched all season against the Packers. Cam Newton played one of his staple MVP games. Now, he's done that to a lot of defenses, but even still. A good defense doesn't give up 500-yard games. And they don't give up 500-yard games to Phillip Rivers throwing passes to not Keenan Allen once he was out of that game. I think at some point you need to look at the picture as a whole and not just one game. I know the season ended because of a lot of different things. But you need to look at the picture as a whole. And the picture as a whole is, realistically, the trend is Dom Capers' scheme plays against a good quarterback and they get lit up. And I think there's more talent on this defense than is capable of being lit up. I think that it's time for Dom Capers to be asked to go elsewhere, whether that means a retirement home. Uh, well, by retirement home, I don't mean a nursing home. I just mean, you know, a beach house in Florida or somewhere else. But I would like to see a defense that instead of bend but don't break and relying on turnovers, so to speak, I'd like to see a defense that is ready to show up and kick some butt, for lack of a better term. Uh, so that's how I feel. Jason, I understand. And I understand that this sounds ridiculous coming off of a – a pretty good game by the defense, but it takes more than pretty good to win a Super Bowl. And something I talked about earlier is, you know, the last two years, the fact has been within inches, inches of playing for a Super Bowl, inches of playing for an NFC title, inches away aren't good enough. And at some point, this kind of becomes a trend. This is what you are. And what it looks like the Packers are right now is a team that their last three playoff losses have come on the final play. The game-winning field goal against San Francisco. The game-winning touchdown to Jermaine Kirsten last year's NFC title. And the game-winning touchdown last night to Larry Fitzgerald. And a lot of almost plays were made. At some point, I think somebody has to be held accountable for that, and you can't cut all the players. I'm looking for a different coach. That's how I feel. Uh, that's how I think the defense needs to be looking going forward. I think they need to be looking at a new voice. And I agree, Jason. I think there's talent to be a top-five defense on that group. That's enough about the game. Uh, obviously, the Packers lost in overtime, 26-20. to 20, We mentioned that. We're going to bring to our final segment of the season for the Mayfield Sports Play of the Game and the Waukesha Sports Game Ball. Thank you to our sponsors. You guys have done a great job for us. If you want a Packers player to spice up one of your events, call these guys. They're your group. Uh, they're a good group of people, good guys, and they do a lot for us over here at She Said TV and Packers Talk Radio Network. We appreciate all you guys have done for us. Mayfield Sports play the game for me. Duh. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you can give another answer to this. It's the Hail Mary. And there's so much about that play that I think qualifies for this play of the game. Jeff Janis. A, uh, Jason, like you said, if you don't live in Green Bay, Wisconsin, nobody knows who the hell Jeff Janis is. Or if you're not a Packers fan, I should say, because I don't live in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I know who Jeff Janis is. But if you're not a Packers fan, you don't know who Jeff Janis is. Janis is the guy who makes the play. Aaron Rodgers is throwing that play. I gushed about it earlier. It was phenomenal. Escaping pressure. Throw it up. Janis makes the play. That's my Mayfield sports play of the game. It tied the game, gave, a Packers, gave the Packers a chance to win in overtime. My game ball, I'm going with Jeff Janis and Jared Aberderis. So I'm splitting the game ball. But I think those guys, they had a lot after them last night. I think some of it may have been unfair. Uh, but I, I think that the those guys deserve a lot of credit for the way because, like I said, coming into the season, you're talking about your fifth and sixth wide receiver on the roster. Jared Aberderis wasn't even on the active roster when they broke training camp. They cut him and put him on the practice squad. He got promoted because he had such a good week in practice or a couple weeks in practice. Jared Aberderis deserves a lot of credit for the way he played last night. And obviously, Jeff Janis, seven catches, 145 yards, two touchdowns. Makes guys like me sound stupid. Gives his cult following, for lack of a better term. The people's champ is what they call him in the Packers beat. He gives them something to talk about, and he gives us a lot to talk about in the offseason. So I, for one, appreciate Jeff Janis because now we can talk about the receiver position, and it's not an easy answer like it's been in the past couple of seasons. So my Mayfield play of the game is the Hail Mary. My game balls go to Jeff Janis and Jared Aberderis. Jason, Mayfield Sports, Walker Shaw Sports, play of the game and game ball. Who you got? Well, since the obvious has been taken, I'll switch it up and give some more credit where credit is due. It's the last game of the season, so I want to acknowledge some of the guys that uh, have played well. My play of the game is actually going to end up being ironic. By the end of this show, you'll understand why. It's going to Eddie Lacy for another long run. He had one last week against the Redskins, and he had one, again, uh, this in this game against the Cardinals. Didn't score because he is just not that fast, and let's be honest, he's out of shape. Got down to the goal line. Packers were able to get in. It was a big run. 
for Lacey against a tough Cardinals defense, and good to see him finish the season a little bit strong, and hopefully that momentum will carry over to next year, and he does a lot more this offseason than he did last offseason to prepare for the upcoming season. So I'll go with Lacey for my play of the game, my Mayfield sports play of the game, and then I'm going to give my Waukesha sports game ball to the offensive line. Aaron Rodgers was sacked eight times the first time these teams met in Week 16. I think he was only sacked once or twice. I know he was sacked once, possibly twice. He was hit several other times, but was able to do a lot more, and obviously the run game was very successful. They put up, you know, the Packers outrushed the Cardinals, and with a guy like David Johnson back there who did such damage to them the first time, that's a big win. So I'm going to give a game ball to those offensive linemen. Those guys stepped up, unsung heroes, and kept Aaron Rodgers clean, and for the most part gave the Packers offense a chance on most every snap. So those are my two in those particular segments there. You know, one thing I want to mention, Jacob, real quick with regards to the coaching situation, and we can have a quick go back, is when Jimmy Robinson was the wide receivers coach in 2010 and the Packers won their Super Bowl, he was valuable to that unit. He got a lot out of them. And he was then signed by the Dallas Cowboys and left. And you saw a bit of a drop-off there. And even as you saw Green Bay move guys around, which they tend to do, you know, they don't let coaches go and interview for lateral moves. It's, you know, it's the team's right to block those opportunities. They want their coaches to stay in Green Bay. So unless it's a promotion opportunity, they don't let them go. And even with some of the, the movement that you've seen, Edgar Bennett was a wide receivers coach, and now with him being an offensive coordinator and handling game, game plan duties during the week, there really isn't a wide receivers coach. Well, what unit struggled this year? What was one of the units that struggled? The wide receivers. So when we talk about these coaching moves, and when you're talking about making coaching moves in a knee-jerk sense, just think of the ripple effect that it creates and where you're, what you're leaving behind and where the hole is. Because in your scenario, Jacob, if Joe Witt comes up and becomes defensive coordinator, I think a lot of us would be happy with that and be okay with it because he knows these players, he knows the defense, he's gotten a lot of really good things out of his corners, but who's going to coach the corners? And you don't want to see a drop-off there. You know, There's a lot of little things to think about when you throw some of those things out there, and that's why I tried to make it clear as I was tweeting last night, which arguing on Twitter is probably one of the most futile exercises in life, that I'm not yes, just on yes, the fire caper. Yes, it is. And I'm not just on the Fire Capers bandwagon because of a playoff loss in one game. I've been saying this for a couple of weeks, and I had my reasons for it, and I laid them out here. So just want to make sure that everybody kind of understands the thought process as we throw some of these things out there that they've been thought through, talked through, kind of you know got a plan in place, and it's not just, we'll get rid of this guy because I don't like him. So, um, yeah, Mayfield, Mayfield uh, play the game. We'll go with the Lacey run. Game ball goes to the O-line. Game ball to the old line for Jason. Play the game to Eddie Lacy's long run. Uh, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of good in that. Obviously, uh, you know the Lacy run. Um, the Lacy run. I think that you know, Jason. You mentioned how he's out of shape. I also want to mention too that he's playing with a ribs injury, and this is back-to-back weeks where he's had a guy squared up. And to me, the signature play of Eddie Lacy's career and kind of the change in mentality around Green Bay is. He has a Vikings defender last year squared up on the goal line, and instead of trying to dance around him, he lowers his shoulder, runs through him, knocks his helmet off, and scores a touchdown. He had similar opportunities the last two weeks, and he tried to kind of dance around him. I think that rib injury definitely definitely has bothered him, um, maybe a little more than is being let on. But nonetheless, you know, a good night for Eddie and really what was a, a relatively lost season. Final play of the game, obviously, and this is a new segment of our show. The, the you know with the there are no more game balls or plays of the game to hand out. The season is over. Uh, the final play of the game: Larry Fitzgerald catches a shovel pass, walks into the end zone, and bang, flat line. Packers are flat line. So Paul for the pack. I know thing is going to be the flat line moment of the week. It might relate to the Packers. It might relate to something around the league. So our flat line moment of the week this week: Larry Fitzgerald getting into the end zone and flat lining the Packers season. And that starts the off season, Jason. And with that, you know, we can't really go too much in depth uh, with, you know, where the Packers are going to be picking in the draft because some of that depends on this game that's playing and the game later. We can't go into signing free agents and things of that nature and go ahead, make your joke how Ted Thompson doesn't sign any free agents. I understand that. But we can't really talk about contract negotiations, stuff like that. So we don't want to get too in depth in the off season. So we're going to start the off season by looking back at the season. So I want to give out team awards. One thing I do want to say about this team is, you know, like I said, this is this is title town USA. And ultimately you are measured in whether or not you win the Super Bowl when you are the Green Bay Packers. One other thing I want to point out, though, is there's like maybe three other teams in the league that have that same expectation, especially nowadays. The New England Patriots are one. 
the Pittsburgh Steelers are probably another one, and I can't really think of another one that is really championship or bust. The Packers are in that, and that means they're a good team. So I do want to say, you know, while ultimately the season is a failure, I, I tend to reflect on how the season went, and I'm still proud of the way they fought, proud of the way they finished. You know, like I said earlier this morning, I'd still rather be a fan of this team than any other one. And I know last night sucked, and this is back-to-back years where, from a fan side of things, it's, you know, heartbreaking, all those poor adjectives you can think of. But I'm still proud to be a fan of this team. But to give out awards, you know, this isn't going to be a a segment where we're just like, well, nobody, because they didn't win a title. Um, Team MVP on offense is where I want to start. We'll go offense, defense for each one of these awards that we give out, uh, except for one of them, and you'll figure out why here pretty quickly. Um, But team MVP for offense how can I not go with James Jones? Uh, James Jones has been a big-time staple to this show. Uh, obviously, you know, he was brought in at the end of training camp because of the injury to Jordy Nelson. So, you know, six months ago when this whole thing started, you didn't even know if James Jones was going to be in the league. He ends up in Green Bay, has a very good season. Jason, like we said last week, you know, the Packers' best receiver this season was James Jones. And that's something, if you had told me that at the beginning of the season, I'd have been like, well, that's kind of stupid because he didn't even uh, – you know, he's not even on the team, you know. And then once he gets on the team, I'm like, okay, well, Randall Cobb's still going to have a pretty good year. Devontae Adams is going to have a good year. When is James Jones going to get the ball? Um, James Jones had a really big year, you know. He, he led the team in uh, – or was really close to leading the team in receiving yards. And, of course, the staple to this show, Jason, and this might be the last time we get to do this because I don't know if he's going to come back, but all James Jones does – All he used to do was catch touchdowns. All he does is catch touchdowns. All he used to do, whatever way you want to look at it. But my team MVP is James Jones, and I can't I can't argue any other way. I think that he's the team's offensive MVP. I think that he deserves that. My team MVP for offense is number 89, James Jones. I wish him luck wherever he ends up because, admittedly, I've grown a soft spot for him. I can't help it. I like the guy. Anytime I've had an interaction with him, he's been very nice to me. He's a pro's pro, you know, all those kind of stereotypical sayings, they, they really do apply to James Jones. He came in, you know, he picked up the offense quickly, had a really good start to the season, and eventually, you know, you kind of saw that James Jones can't be your best wide receiver if you're going to have a good offense. But I appreciate James Jones. I hope there's a way they can bring him back, but we'll talk more and more about that as the offseason progresses as to why I, I don't think that that's going to happen. Um but my MVP, before I go too far, is James Jones. Jason, offensive MVP is who? Well, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about the offense, and there isn't really outside of James Jones anybody who consistently shined through this year. I mean, you think about guys like Lacey, but he, he came on late, but he was inconsistent. He had troubles early. He was injured. Think about guys like James Starks, but he fumbled four straight games. Richard Rodgers just didn't, you know, caught the Hail Mary, but that's one play. The offensive line, those guys, you know, battled through some injuries and weren't spectacular, but they got the job done at times. You can't go with Kuhn as much as everybody loves John Kuhn because he just didn't play enough. So it's it's tough on the offensive side. You know, Cobb had games where he struggled, and these other receivers, obviously, Aberderis and Janice, didn't, didn't play much, and we lost Montgomery halfway through the season. So if I can't go Aaron Rodgers, then I'm going to have to cheat a little bit and because, you know, Aaron Rodgers, obviously, you know, we don't have to break that down. He's he's 12, and 12 is what does what 12 does. And he will be back and do those things again next year, barring injury. So if I can't go Rodgers, then I'm either going to have to abstain or I'm going to have to cheat a little bit and say he's not an offensive player, but he definitely generates points. And that would be Mason Crosby, the place kicker, who made a lot of pretty clutch kicks this year, was pretty dependable with the exception of the Detroit game at the end of that. It was awful. It was a terrible kick, and I think he had a couple blocked this year as well. But, you know, that extra point last night with the new rules, with the PAT being over 30 yards now, is not a gimme anymore. And he put it through right down the middle with no problem. Those are the kind of things that he struggled with three years ago. We all remember the the terrible season he had in 2012 and has bounced back and got himself back to playing, kicking the best that we've seen him kick in his career. So, Aaron Rodgers, if we're going straight offense, if we're going to exclude Rodgers because he's the obvious choice, then i got to go with Crosby because, again, team's leading scorer and came through in the clutch, unfortunately. Would have loved to have seen him kick a game winner last night, but just didn't get a chance to possess the ball and have that chance. 
All right, so Jason's going with Mason Crosby. I'm not sure how I feel about giving that to a kicker, but nonetheless, when you have a year like they had on offense, then it's semi-understandable. Uh, defense now, this was the strongest unit of the team um, throughout the season, and I know we talked a lot about the defense, but you know they still had a very good year despite the poor finish. Um, so I'm going to talk about the team MVP on defense. It's Clay Matthews, and I know that his numbers were down from a sack standpoint, but here's why I think that's the case. Last year, they moved him to inside linebacker, and it was kind of a desperation move. They move him to the middle, which is a position he's never played. The defense takes off. They have a really good year, uh, from the, or a really good half year, I should say. The defense looks entirely different with Clay in the middle through last season. He comes in this year. Last year, he kind of said he wanted to play back outside. You know, This year, he comes in. And it really is kind of the romanticism of the sport of giving up what's best for you in order for what's best for the team. Matthew's primary position this year was inside linebacker, and he was a pro bowler at the spot. The Packers needed that for him to be good, because otherwise, or for the defense to be good, I should say, because otherwise the Packers starting inside linebackers coming into the year were going to be Nate Palmer and Sam Barrington, and eventually it would have been Nate Palmer and Jake Ryan, assuming things stay the same way. That's not good. Uh, for lack of a better term. So this year, you know, we'll talk about off-season needs and stuff, but if the Packers want to move Clay back outside, they need uh, they need an inside linebacker or two because otherwise we're talking about A.J. Hawk and Brad Jones type level of inside linebacker play all over again. But to me, other than Mike Daniels, Clay Matthews is the best player on this defense, and you've seen what happens when he's not in the lineup. He's what makes this thing go, and this defense is good when he's in there. He's an elite-level player. He's one of the best players at his position, whether that's inside or out. My team defense MVP goes to Clay Matthews. And in my opinion, Clay Matthews, other than Reggie White and Charles Woodson, is the best defensive player of my lifetime. And I'm very comfortable saying that. Jason, defense MVP goes to. Going to go with the big guy up front, Mike Daniels. For the most part, this season earned every penny that that contract, that extension is paying him, and I am so glad that he's going to be in green and gold for several years to come. He did show up big on the stat sheets. He had a tough outing. I think it was against the Raiders. Had a sack last night against Carson Palmer. Brings the fire, brings the, the heat. He's the kind of guy you want in the locker room. He's the attitude you want this entire defense to take on, which I, I do credit Daniels for the defense kind of bringing the nasty. You know, he's a guy that's jumps in there and kind of picks up where they lost to Ryan Pickett, a guy like that that you can count on that's dependable, and hopefully they bring B.J. Raji back and you get Daniels and Raji, and who knows what the heck is going on with Dayton Jones, but hopefully those guys come back and form that tough front again, and, and they're tough again. I'm going with Mike Daniels. He was a consistent rock this entire season, and again, it's because of his play on the field, makes the play, steps up, backs up his talk with his walk, and did so more often than not. Mike Daniels, defensive MVP, for sure. Got to give some credit to one of the big fats up front. And he deserves it. He he was every bit of fantastic. And and in me, you've heard me talk about momentum and and matchups and attitude and all these little intangibles that that don't necessarily happen on the field. Daniels is the guy you want on your team because guys are going to feed off of that, and this defense is going to be all the better because he's around for the next couple years. Okay, so Jason going to Mike Daniels, and I'm going to gush about Mike Daniels as well because he's one of my favorite players on this team. And, you know, he's not J.J. Watt. He's not uh, Aaron Donald. He's not K1 Short from the Carolina Panthers. But I think he's in that next tier of defensive linemen. He doesn't have the prototypical size. Nothing about him really screams NFL stud defensive lineman from a paper standpoint. But once you get on the field, he's an ass-kicking machine. Uh, and that's what I love about him. He's got the attitude. He's one of the vocal leaders on this defense from everything you can tell, uh, and he's really done a lot of good things the last couple of seasons to make this a better unit. Mike Daniels is Jason, defensive MVP. I went with Clay Matthews. Obviously, with the highs, there are going to be lows. Most disappointing uh, most disappointing player on offense and defense, and Jason will go at the same time. Get both at the same time for the sake of time. Offense, i got to go with Devontae Adams because this was a year where after Nelson got hurt, Packers needed a receiver to step up and be a big-time player. Devontae Adams' year was played with drops, inconsistent play, injuries, etc. He was not the star that he was built up to be in the offseason. And that's something that they needed. They needed him to be a star because they didn't have a star at wide receiver. Like I said, their best receiver throughout the season was Jamie Kelly. And as much as I do love Randall Cobb, I know that a lot of people are going to look at his contract and say he's not worth $10 million a year. Slot receivers are dependent on other people around them being good or a scheme being good. Well, the Packers' scheme wasn't going to change. Isolation routes, stuff like that. 
people will point to Julian Edelman and say, look at him. Well, they have this guy named Rob Gronkowski, and he's pretty damn good. Uh, best tight end in football, arguably could be the best move tight end ever once the season or once his career is all said and done, assuming he stays healthy. But I got to go with Devontae Adams. Uh, Adams deserves this, I think. Uh, you know, he put together some good games at the end of the season. Played well. You know, had a couple of uh, had a couple good good plays against the Minnesota Vikings. Was a really good player against uh, the Washington Redskins in the playoffs before getting injured by Richard Rodgers, who was a close second for this award. And I'll talk more about him later as well. But offense, offense, most disappointing player. I am going to go with Devontae Adams. And on defense. It's really hard to say that a player disappointed because if you look around and kind of go player by player, nobody really didn't meet expectations. But this is a show that we're paid, and I'm using that term in jest, to have opinions. So my opinion, Micah Hyde. Um, and this is nothing against Micah as a player. Uh, I think that he's he kind of represents kind of some things that I think are wrong with this coaching staff, and they value, quote, good football players, not overly athletic, but smart, stuff like that. Micah Hyde was a Packers tight end guy, and to me, the signature play for him during the season, I know he made some nice plays. The one-handed interception uh, against the Minnesota Vikings was phenomenal, but I, the play that sticks out in my mind is Owen Daniels running away from him in the in a game against the Denver Broncos. Nothing against Owen Daniels, but, you know, that's not exactly Jordy Nelson running a route there against him that he shouldn't be able to keep up. So for lack of a good choice, I'm going with Micah Hyde. Jason, most disappointing for you? So I talked earlier about an ironic choice that I made. I talked about Lacey earlier when I gave him the play of the game because obviously you picked the Hail Mary uh, in the Cardinals game. Lacey had a couple big runs at the end of the season to give us to show us that there's some life left in those legs. He's he's going into the final year of his, I believe it's the final year of his rookie contract. Yes, and uh, so he is with the Packers next season, but beyond that is still a big question mark, and I think a lot of us, I think, Jacob, you and I are both on the same page. At present clip, at present state today, barring all other factors, I don't think either one of us are convinced that Lacey should be back in a Packers uniform. So I'm going to go with Eddie Lacey because he just didn't meet the expectations. Part of his, you know, part of it was his being a a victim of his, previous success of the first two years of his career where he rushed for over a thousand yards part of it was the injury that he suffered the ankle injury he suffered earlier in the season in week two against the seattle seahawks that took him a while to recover from he had some mental gaffes he had the curfew miss in detroit missed the bulk of the detroit game really kind of took a step back and regressed for what you'd expect of a third year veteran who's been a big staple of your offense and a, and a guy that this team really needed at that time so all those factors put together, I'm going to go with Eddie Lacy. But the silver lining here is that we had to pick somebody, and I, I was I was still probably more. I, I think the Packers got more out of Lacy than they didn't this year. But I think that that he left a lot out out there that he could have contributed that he didn't. So I'll go with Eddie Lacy. You already you already covered Devontae Adams. Uh, I think you know Tay Adams. Unfortunately, like you you mentioned, maybe a victim of the hype that surrounded him that a lot of the the media and Aaron Rodgers specifically were, and Mike McCarthy were pouring on him in the preseason. And with young guys like that, you have to be careful. You got to really watch what kind of pressure you put on them because, yes, they're highly paid and these guys should be able to step up and perform at a high level. But everybody's still a human being and everybody still has a personality. So you got to tailor those expectations and tailor the message to those players in a way that's going to motivate them and get the best out of them. And Devontae Adams, unfortunately, was not able to give the Packers that this year. Also had issues with an ankle injury too. So got to go with Eddie Lacy. But hopefully this is the you know the the last of any of the disappointments. Or you know we'll revisit the 2015 season for sure about the off season and some of the things that the team's going to do now and the news that breaks and some of the stuff that goes on week after week. But hopefully this is the last of of some of the the negatives that we saw this year. We can kind of erase that from our memories. And much like how we very rarely refer back to that that game that shall not be mentioned, hopefully this season also falls into that category as they move forward. And, and hopefully we're talking about at this time next year, you know, let's hope we're talking about some success and a game the following weekend, which would mean another conference championship. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself right now. It's It's been fun. It's been a fun season. And, and despite all the disappointments that ended it, you know, Jacob, I got to ask you this. I think I know the answer to it. It's kind of the, you know the the obvious question, but you look at the way this season finished compared to the way this team was playing in the middle of the season. They got a playoff victory. Really, probably could have had two 
And had they beaten the Cardinals on the road, I mean, I don't know how you, I don't, I don't know how you can't say that this team really overachieved and made some serious magic out of a season that just didn't seem to have any to it. You know, um, bust was the 2015 season a bust or not? Um, from the standpoint of, like I said earlier, you know, Title Town USA, they didn't win any titles, no Super Bowl, no division, stuff like that. From that standpoint, yes. When you look at the way the team played as a whole, I got a hard time saying that. Because, I mean, our guy Marcus Eversall, the original host of this show, said, you know, like a week ago, he could have argued, and pretty staunchly, that Detroit was a better team than the Packers currently. I know that sounds ridiculous because they finished 7-9 and nine and the Packers finished 10-6 and six and blah, 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 but Detroit was playing better football than the Packers were at the end of the season. They won a playoff game, albeit against the Redskins, and Jason, like you said, they could have won two, and pending the result of this game, which we didn't know last night, could have been hosting the NFC Championship game. If Seattle wins, they got an NFC title game at home that they could have won. I mean, they already beat Seattle this year once. Now, I know that was a long time ago, and Seattle's playing better, and Green Bay's not playing as well, and they don't have some of their guys and stuff like that, but, I mean, you can't win the game if you're not in it. So, no, I, I can't call it pointing based on what I saw as the season went on. Now, that means the result. Now, some of the stuff throughout the year was disappointing, and that makes the season a disappointment. So I, I sound like I'm waffling, but I'm really not. Uh, you know, it, it was a disappointment from the standpoint of they didn't win a title, but with the way the season played out, like I said, you know, after after a point in the year, you could have argued that teams that didn't make the playoffs were playing better than the Packers were. They found some mojo. They were overtime away from playing in the NFC Championship game. With the way the season went, you couldn't – and they, they were overtime away from an NFC Championship game with Jared Abra, Darius, and Jeff Janis as their two and three wide receiver for the majority of the game. I got a hard time calling that a disappointment. Maybe I've got my green and gold goggles on. I fully admit that, but I can't call it – I can't call it a, a bust because that would mean absolutely nothing went well and everybody should be fired. And I, I don't think everybody should be fired, and I, I don't think nothing went well either. Um and that's a pretty good segue into our into our next segment of the show. Uh, we've got the, the rookie of the year, and this was the easiest one. Um, difficult from the standpoint of offensively, there wasn't a lot there as far as rookies go. Uh, if we had to give it to one, it would be Ty Montgomery, but Ty Montgomery only played in six games. So we didn't have an award for offensive rookie of the year. Defensively, though, not a lot of competition, but that was a good thing. Jason, your school, your guy, who was our rookie of the year for the Green Bay Packers this year? This was our 2015 first-round draft pick out of Arizona State University, cornerback, safety turn cornerback, Demarius Randall, and it wasn't close. I mean, Randall, first-round pick, you expect a lot of things out of him, but I don't think any of us expected all that we did get from him. Had a nice interception last night, played well above his rookie stature all season long. It's a no-brainer, not even worth discussing and debating or trying to pick a different person so we can each throw a name out there. It's Randall hands down, and he's he's got so much promise. And you throw him out there, you get Sam Shields, who's still young. You got Ha Ha Clinton Dix, and Morgan Burnett's got a couple more years left in him too. This secondary could become one of the better secondaries in the NFL. This secondary could I don't think any will ever be what Seattle's used to be, but I think this this secondary could be just as effective. And a big part of why the defense takes a step forward, Demarius Randall, and you know, tough kid. Got hurt again yesterday, got dinged up a couple times this season, but played through a lot of it, went out there and played through it. Those are the kind of things with a rookie, you're wide-eyed, you come into the NFL, you don't know what to expect. It's a 16-game season. It's longer than the college season is. You know, A lot of these guys kind of tend to buckle under the pressure, stepped up and made plays when it counted, just, just plays football. That's what I like about him is that he just plays football. And those are the kind of guys that I've been clamoring for this team to have more of, these guys that just play, react, do, don't overthink and just get so mind blown that they don't know what to do, where to go. He's instinctual. Couldn't have couldn't have been happier with this with this pick. And this was a guy that a lot of people were scratching their head at and said, "Ted Thompson, what are you doing here?" But he made us all look pretty foolish uh, after the season that Randall put together. It was fantastic. Absolutely, Demarius Randall. You know, Jason. Going into the season, we discussed some going into the season. We discussed some possibility of growing pains because they were replacing Devon House and Tremont Williams, two veterans with essentially two rookies. Demarius Randall was one, and Quentin Rollins obviously was the other one. Um, you know, the uh, the way that you were thinking that was going to go, the you kind of thought that, you know, Casey Hayward, you saw he couldn't really play the boundary. They had him as their starting corner. Micah Hyde was their slot corner. Demarius Randall's emergence 
Demarius Randall's emergence was enough to make this defense a really good unit because if they had to go the whole season with Hayward outside and Hyde in the slot, I don't think this season would have gone nearly as well defensively as it ended up going. So Demarius Randall, very deserving of Rookie of the Year, very bright future in the secondary, I think. Uh, I think that, you know, you combine Randall and Rollins with Shields, I think that you got three really good corners potentially. Uh, I like both players. Uh, I think that both are going to be good players for years to come. Uh, Demarius Randall, though, 2015 Rookie of the Year, which brings us to our final award segment. And this one, there's really only two plays that you can debate, in my opinion. But one more bonus for Mark Mayfield. Mayfield Sports Play of the Year. Season's over, obviously. We can reflect on all plays. There's only two that come to mind, in my opinion. There's the Hail Mary at Detroit, and there's the Hail Mary in Arizona. I will take the one in Arizona just because I think it was a little more ridiculous. You've got your sixth wide receiver on the field. I think the throw by Rodgers was better, going against the grain, throwing it up, big moment in the playoffs. My Mayfield Sports play of the year, Aaron Rodgers to Jeff Janis to tie the divisional round playoff game. Jason, do you have another one? If you do, I might have to question your sanity, but do you have another one, or do you have Richard Rodgers, or are you going to agree with me and go with Jeff Janis? Mayfield Sports play of the year is what? I'm going with Richard Rodgers because at that time, Green Bay was in a funk. They had they had just lost to the Bears on Thanksgiving, which was probably the most disgusting and disappointing loss of the season. And I, I'd put that up against this Cardinals loss. Obviously, everybody always hates the one that ends the season. That Bears loss was worse than the Detroit loss at home for the first time in 21, 24 years. And they had every reason to put a beating on the Chicago Bears and couldn't do it. Came out four days later. We're getting beat by Detroit. This season would have gone a completely different direction, I think, had they not somehow found a way to win that game. That play right there turned things around and started a three-game winning streak. Unfortunately, it got derailed by the Cardinals. First meeting between the Cardinals and the Packers. They weren't able to win the Week 17 game, but they got into the playoffs. That right there is, a, is had Green Bay beat Arizona and somehow gone on and created some more magic next weekend against whoever wins this Carolina and Seattle game that would have been talked about and looked at as a huge turning point in the season. When the NFL Films 30 for 30 came out or the NFL Films 2015 Green Bay Packers film came out, that play would have been the lead. That would have been the absolute epic highlight of the day. So I'll go with the Rodgers Hail Mary. I just think, Jacob, you and I are very fortunate and blessed. We need to save a copy of this show forever and ever and ever because I'm willing to bet everything I have and my house that we're never going to be able to choose between two Hail Mary plays for a play of the season again in our lifetimes. <laughs> hard, to, hard to disagree with that. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, play of the year, we're choosing between two Hail Marys. I like Jeff Janis. Jason likes Richard Rodgers because of the timing. I understand both arguments. Uh, I agree. I agree with Jason for the same reasons I agree with myself. Two great plays, Hail Marys the most exciting play in sports. And to be honest with you, I've had a pretty sour taste in my mouth for Hail Marys forever because, you know, the the Giants game in the playoffs comes to mind. Obviously the Seattle game where MD Jennings caught the ball and they said that Golden Tate caught the ball. And Jason, that was kind of the inspiration of one of our conversations with Marcus yesterday, uh, which is really entertaining. I wanted to let you know on air that I appreciated that conversation that we had. But uh, so there you have it, guys. Play of the year. I got Jeff Janis to say I'll marry. Jason's got Richard Rogers, rookie of the year. I had Demarius Randall, MVP. I had James Jones and Clay Matthews. Jason, Jason went with Aaron Rodgers slash Mason Crosby, and defense he went with Mike Daniels. So those are our awards. We'll tweet them out for you later. Uh, if you agree, disagree again at Packer Pulse. Let us know how you're feeling about our decisions that we made uh, going into this show. Let us know if we're crazy. Let us know if you agree with us and why. At Packer Pulse is where to find us, though. And then a general overview for the final segment of the show is what we're going to do. Obviously, now it's free agency and draft season. It's one of my favorite times of the year. It's kind of bittersweet because, obviously, the season for the Packers is over. Uh, But I love the draft. And those of you that have followed this show or any of the shows that I'm on, I'm a draft guy. I'm a junkie when it comes to this stuff. I I can't get enough of it. Uh, I think that there's a lot of of players that happen to be in this draft that fit the needs of the Packers and some free agents as well if Ted Thompson decides to go that route. But what I want to know, Jason, the three biggest needs for the Packers going into the offseason are what? For me, I will start with, and I've been harping on this since Jermichael Finley broke his neck, uh, tight end. And this is nothing against Richard Rodgers and Andrew Corliss and this entire group. I think that they have some value as role players, but I think that uh, 
The Packers need somebody that is dynamic, can stretch the field and beat man coverage. They need somebody that can run that little, you know, drag route and pick up seven yards on that play instead of two, which we came all too accustomed to with Richard Rodgers this season. Realistically, that play ended the Packers' hope of an NFC North title because they ran that play to Rodgers. He didn't get a first down. The clock ran. They couldn't spike the ball. All kinds of stuff happened on that play that was not good. Uh, and I saw that play too much this year. I think Richard Rodgers is a good red zone target, and I think that's about it. I think that the Packers need a, quote, move tight end, someone like Jermichael Finley. And for those of you that hated Jermichael Finley during his time here, do you miss him now? Because I think you should. Maybe not him the person, but his skill set. The Packers need a guy with that kind of skill set. There's names, draft names I can't really bring out because the guy that I really, two of the guys I really like look like they're going back to school, Michigan's Jake Butt and Alabama's O.J. Howard. It looks like both of them are going to go back to school, which is good for my college football rooting interest, but for my pro team purpose, it doesn't look like uh, doesn't look like the Packers are going to be able to get either one of those guys. Uh, Darius Green, Martellus Bennett are a couple free agent names that come to mind that are possible. Uh, Martellus Bennett, this is assuming he gets released and or traded from the Chicago Bears in the offseason. My second need is the one we've been talking about for about five years, and that's inside linebacker. Even if they're going to keep Clay Matthews on the inside, I think you can upgrade from Jake Ryan. And the Jake Ryan, Joe Thomas platoon, which is really what it is. Jake Ryan plays on, you know, medium to intermediate distance, running type downs. He's okay against the run. He's a solid player. I think he'll be okay on special teams. Uh, you know, you've got all kinds of stuff that um, all kinds of stuff that you can do differently on the inside. I think that I think that uh, I think that the Packers need an athlete in the middle of that defense, and I think that that could be next to Clay Matthews, or it could be. You know, Clay Matthews is replacement, so to speak. But you can't go into the season next year hoping that if you move Clay back outside, that Jake Ryan and Sam Barrington are going to step up and be your linebackers. Because, like I said, that's Hawk and Jones. And I'm not comparing the players specifically to those guys, but I think that that would be the kind of level that you're looking at of play there. So inside linebacker is my second one. And my third one, I'm going to kind of cheat. I know I just gave a lot of love to Jared Abadaris and Jeff Janis. Um, but that being said, I still think there's some depth that could be added. I think that Ted Thompson is very good at picking wide receivers. And I think you saw this year that they need another guy that really could be a star. I don't know if Devontae Adams could end up that way. But I think that they need someone else that can play the boundary just in case Janice never figures out how to run a route properly outside of the fly route or if Aberderis can't stay healthy, things of that nature. Josh Doxson's the name that comes to mind from TCU. I think he could be had in the second round. And I don't want to get too much into that, but there's some names – I think wide receiver is one. Otherwise, if not receiver, if they're content with that, then I'm going to go running back because I think that they could look for not just a guy to replace Starks, but potentially a guy to replace Eddie Lacy as well. Um, you know, you saw the season Lacy had. You saw the potential commitment issues. I don't know if that's a guy that you can afford to pay big money, and you know that James Starks is a free agent. He may or may not be back uh, this upcoming season. That remains to be seen, but – not only that, they need a third down catching, pass catching back regardless, uh, whether that means it's Randall Cobb or Ty Montgomery, or if that means an actual running back similar to what the Eagles have in Darren Sproles, what the Patriots have had in the past with Shane Green, now they have with James White. Guys of that nature. Someone that can kind of, you know, work the flats and give the Packers some of that wiggle ability in the open field. Give them a true pass receiver at running back. So my three biggest needs, dynamic tight end, inside linebacker, and wide receiver slash running back. Jason, you got anything? Yeah, so I'm going to also go with tight end, number one. Obviously, it's a big need. Rodgers, Richard Rodgers just isn't, doesn't have the speed, and, and this offense is kind of predicated on a guy that can run down the seam and get open and create a little bit more like a receiver. Wouldn't hurt if they could find a guy that could block occasionally as well. That was something that Richard Rodgers struggled big with this season, and so they had some issues there in terms of that. My number two need is going to be linebacker. I think they need a guy specifically more on the outsider to rush the passer, somebody who's a burner. You're not going to find a Khalil Mack where the Packers are going to be picking because they're going to be picking 25th or higher and or lower, whichever, you know, towards the end of the first round. So it's going to be tough for them to find an impact guy. But want to see them add a linebacker, add some depth there. Sam Barrington's going to hopefully come back. You know, they lost him really early this season, and, and I'm not sure what he would have become. He was kind of inconsistent last year, so not sure if he comes back and solidifies himself there and then, You've got a good problem to have in terms of Clay in the middle when he is in the middle, and then you've got Jake Ryan, Sam Barrington. I don't think we'll see Nate Palmer back, and so I think they're going to have to add another guy there. Joe Thomas was good in situations, but I just don't think he has the size to really be what the Packers need, and I think if they can replace him with somebody bigger and quicker, 
that they should thank him for his services and let him go find another home somewhere else, possibly in a 4-3. But my third need, actually, is going to be the offensive line, and that's because of the disaster that we saw in the first Carolina – or first Cardinals matchup, I should say, with all the sacks that were given up because when David Bakhtiari was down and there weren't any other options – they had Josh Walker and Don Barclay out there, and both of them were a complete failure and huge embarrassment to this team. So I don't want to see either one of them back on the active roster next year. I think the Packers need to solidify the depth on the offensive line and get a true tackle to come in that can swing either to the right or to the left side. Maybe a little bit of an earlier round pick. Wouldn't mind seeing them do that in maybe the fourth or fifth round this season. Solidify, like I said, that depth that they have there, and then you've got J.C. Treader there, of course, and Lane Taylor, and they can just decide what direction that they want to go and, and which which two guys they want to keep to kind of back everybody up. So those are going to be my draft needs. I don't have a lot of names to throw out there, and I know that we're going to be breaking that down and talking more specifically about the draft, and we're going to hopefully have a couple of really good guests to help us with those conversations too. We've already started the process of trying to line some of those up to join us on the show. Jacob, you mentioned tweeting out our, our MVPs. I have already tweeted those out, actually, so they're out there. I've already seen a couple of likes on Twitter, so I think there's a lot of our fans and listeners who agree with us. But all in all, you know, I asked earlier if the season was a bust, and I think we're in agreement there. I think in terms of the, the way that the season finished and that they didn't accomplish their goal, yes, it was. And, and my confidence in them getting to a championship is kind of shot. So, you know, going into that next season, unless they're completely dominating everybody and they have home field and they have a good matchup against a team that maybe got lucky to be there, I don't know how much I can believe they get over the hump. But I certainly would love to see them prove me wrong and get there, no doubt about it. But that's going to be a lot of fun for us to talk about. You know, unfortunately, the offseason comes a little bit sooner. But, you know, in terms of some of the other games before we go, you know, you've got this Carolina and Seattle, and Carolina's got still got a lead here. And it looks like, you know, they're in the fourth quarter, and that one should kind of be wrapping up soon. But now you've got, you know, potentially the matchup between the Cardinals and the Panthers in Carolina next week for the NFC Championship game. If that is, in fact, the matchup, you know, I personally think Carolina's got the home field. They've got the momentum. I I think Cam and and company get it done. How do you see that one, Jacob? Uh, Assuming that's the matchup, I will say this. I think that regardless, because it looks like right now there's, as I speak, there's five minutes left in this game. Carolina has the ball leading by 10. Seattle's making attempts at a remarkable comeback. If Seattle comes back and wins this game or Carolina wins, from a who's playing better standpoint, I like either one of the winners of this game. So Carolina or Seattle, I like them to beat Arizona. Next week, uh, regardless of where it's at, I thought Carson Palmer looked shaky last night, and both of these defenses are better than the Packers' defense. Um, I think if, Car- or if Arizona's going to win that game, excuse me, that they're going to need David Johnson to have a big week because that, that finger injury that Carson Palmer has appears to be affecting his throws. And, you know, the, uh, they're going to need they're gonna need a little bit of help from the running game in that case. And I'll transition to the AFC now. Is, you know, later, obviously, we're going to have New England against either Pittsburgh or Denver. And in which case, I am personally selfishly hoping – for Peyton Manning against Tom Brady one final time for the AFC crown. However, I think Pittsburgh is the only team remaining that can beat the New England Patriots, and I don't even feel that confident in that with a limited Ben Roethlisberger. And you don't know if Antonio Brown's going to be able to play next week. So I think either way, I like I like New England, and I think it's going to be New England against uh, Carolina when it's all said and done. So Cam Newton against Tom Brady in the Super Bowl. Brady gets to another Super Bowl. This is his 10th AFC Championship game. He's the greatest quarterback I've ever seen, guys, in terms of accomplishment and the way that they just, they always seem to find a way. Tom Brady is, in my opinion, the greatest quarterback in my short lifetime. So I got a hard time betting against him. Uh, But I think it'll be Carolina against New England from here on out. I reserve the right to change my mind for next week's show. So, Jason, what do you think of the AFC's playoff picture? I think we're in agreement with Antonio Brown being out. I don't think Pittsburgh gets past Denver. I wish they would. I'd I'd rather see Pittsburgh go. I think it would would be a lot more fun to watch Roethlisberger and Brady duke it out. You know, Brady and Manning has that, that, you know, novelty to it, but Peyton Manning just isn't what he was before, and I just don't know. And in the playoffs, he's had a lot of struggles. So I don't know what kind of game we're in for in that one. Obviously, those of you listening to this after Sunday already know the result. And then next weekend – if you do have Brady and Manning, I'm, I'm going with Tom Brady. I think Brady and the Patriots make it to another Super Bowl, solidifying an incredible legacy in a time in which teams are not supposed to be doing what the Patriots are doing and are the example of what I wish the Packers could do 
And then in the NFC, I think you've got Carolina and Arizona. And like I said before, I think Cam and company get it done. So then you'd have a rematch of the 2003 season Super Bowl between the Patriots and the Panthers. That would be a great game. And also a matchup that I can certainly deal with because those are the, the two teams that I'd, I'd kind of like to see get in there. So that's that's kind of how I see it shaking up. I'm just glad there's still some football to be watched. And you know that you're a true football fan, and you know that you're going to be okay when you wake up the day after a, a game like last night and a finish like that. And the first thing you, you look for is what time does the game start and what channel is it on because you're ready for some football, even if it's not your team. Absolutely agree with that. Um, so, like we said, you know, thirty-one twenty-one Carolina right now. There's two forty-nine left. Carolina just punted. Should be a good finish here. Again, Seattle horseshoe, rabbit foot, any lucky thing possible. I mean, they're really fortunate to be in this game uh, right now. Especially, it was thirty-one to nothing at one point. So that kind of tells you, kudos to Seattle. A lot of teams were packed up and gone home. They did as much as it pains me to say that, but. Uh, We're looking at an interesting Super Bowl. Uh, We're looking at an interesting week of championship games. It sucks that Green Bay won't be able to participate in those things, but nonetheless, it should be some good football for the rest of today and next week as well. Uh, Looking forward to that. And that wraps up our final season show, Pulse of the Pack. Looking forward to the offseason. Like Jason said, we kind of previewed it a little bit today. Uh, We'll talk more and more. We're kind of working on some guests to get in, talk drafts, talk, you know, all kinds of stuff, uh, free agency, just how do the Packers get over the hump again? It looks like we're having the same conversation this year as we did last year, but I think it'll be an interesting offseason in Green Bay. Uh, And for those of you, I'll give you a little tease for our offseason. Look up the term force players. That's going to be one of our guests, I'm hoping, at some point in time after the Combine. All kinds of interesting stuff. Like I said, the season never rests. The Super Bowl ends. The Combine's two weeks later. Uh, You're going to free agency a couple weeks after that. 24-7, 24-7, 365 sport the NFL is. So we're looking forward to that. But that will do it for today's show. Be sure to check out PackersTalk.com for all your latest Packers news and podcasts. Check out Cheesehead TV. You can follow the show. Again, we have a new Twitter handle. We are at Packer Pulse. We've seen some likes, some favorites, stuff like that on Twitter. Send us questions during our live shows or during our downtime. We will do our best to answer them on the air. Thank you to those who sent questions today. Uh, sorry we could not get to all of them, but we did get to a couple. Um, we appreciate the the interaction that you guys give because, like I said all season, this show is for you guys. You follow me personally on Twitter. I'm at Jacob Westendorf. You can follow Jason. He's at Jason Perone. Looking forward to a lot of interesting stuff as this off season gets underway. The Packers, again, just short of a Super Bowl. They go into overtime, lose at Arizona, uh, and the season ends that way. The flat line moment of the week again, Larry Fitzgerald. Larry Fitzgerald gets into the end zone on a shovel pass and gets the Packers out of the playoffs. Arizona moves on to either host or go to Carolina for the NFC Championship game. Again, we'll see it's New England. New England will either host Pittsburgh or go to Denver for one more Manning-Brady showdown. Either way, it's Manning-Brady or Manning-Roethlisberger. Jason, like you mentioned, those are quarterback duels for the ages. Thank you guys all season. I want to thank our sponsors, uh, Mayfield Sports, Waukesha Sports. They were our game ball and play of the game sponsors through the season. We want to thank all the work they do for us because it is not they are not done just because the Packers season is done. They'll do more for us again. You want you want a Packers player to spice up your event? Those are the guys to contact. Uh, thank you guys again for listening. I can't thank you guys enough. You're the reason we do this show. So I appreciate you guys listening in all season long. Hopefully next year at this time we're talking about a much better result um, and – you know, maybe Green Bay moving on to the Super Bowl, moving on to the championship game, whatever, however the calendar falls next season. But hopefully we're talking about a different result this year. Thank you guys all season. I also... Are you looking for some signed Packer memorabilia? Look no further than Waukesha Sports Cards. If a Green Bay Packer can sign it, Waukesha Sports Cards has it. Check our website for upcoming Packer player and legend signing. Go to WaukeshaSportsCards.com. Eddie Lacy, Mike Daniels, Gilbert Brown, Don Barclay, Micah Hyde, your Green Bay Packers, yesterday's legends and today's superstars. From corporate or nonprofit events to private parties, add some spice, hire a Packers player from Mayfield Sports Marketing. For details, just go to PackersTalk.com and click on Player Appearances.